was a world renowned aviation journalist, a fellow by the name of Richard Collins. Richard was the editor of Flying Magazine for, I think, a hundred years, a long time. There was nothing you could tell Richard that he didn't already know. And sometimes he reminded you of that. Had a job to go demonstrate the diamond of Richard Collins. It's a little bit daunting because the last thing you want to do is, is give a bad impression and you know that, that could sink a new product dead. I remember we were doing an engine out demonstration with Richard. I told him, I said, we're going to do some things that you probably have never seen before. And he kind of looked over at me like this, you know, over his glasses, and he said, I highly doubt that. He said, let me go through this engine out procedure with you, and then I'll let you do it. He could be a gruff speaker. He looked over at me after this, and he says, how the blank does this airplane do this? He says, how does this do this? And I think that type of reaction, um, you know, from people who are extraordinarily experienced in all things GA, couldn't have been said any better. Uh, yeah, how the blank does this airplane do this? Diamond's priority is safety. It always is and always will be. It's safety by design, uh, but it's also luxury and it's also looks. It's a perfect marriage of the two. It's, it's fast, it's convenient, it's cost effective, but it's, it's also attractive. I would get people coming up to me. I would have pilots just approach me. Is this the new DA-62? They have to see it up close. When I'm on a ramp and a pilot taxis by me, you can always see him mouthing the words, I think that's one of those diamonds. It's quite an experience to land a diamond at an airport. No matter what FBO you pull into, everyone comes out and wants to see it. I can't tell you how many times I've landed and all I hear is, nice looking airplane. The tower will just respond, nice looking airplane. And it makes you feel good about it, right? It's one of those airplanes that actually flies better than it looks. And it's always apparent that that's actually the case when we get down from a demonstration flight and you see the smiles on these people's faces and uh, they realize that they haven't been given a salesman's pitch. They've actually flown an airplane that really does live up to all the hype. It's, it's tough to put that plane in words. They're one of the best flying aircraft I've ever experienced. Uh, it, and you see that in demos. You take somebody up that, that might fly a Cirrus or Brand X or something else, and they get into this, you can see that smile. They get out of that thing and wow. In terms of going from point A to point B, if you're really looking to travel or get somewhere comfortably, uh, nothing beats the DA-62. In terms of passenger comfort or, or, or pilot comfort, um, you just have so much space in that cabin, the ability to take so much with you. It has a lot of useful load. And of course, the safety with the second engine, whether you're flying at night or over mountains or over water. We are the, the new generation aircraft. We're the new generation airframe. Being composite, being diesels, uh, being the forefront of the, the avionics. We had that advantage of designing an airplane much later in time and, and learning all the things that you do uh, that come with time and studying aviation accidents and incidents and then working on designs that help improve those uh, things that were causing issues uh, with previous models. It gave me everything that I wanted. It flies well in turbulence. It flies well in different weather systems. The fuel efficiency is phenomenal. The fact that we're able to burn Jet A in that airplane, which is a big cost consideration as, as opposed to avgas, is a big plus. Lots of utility, lots of versatility. Even if you fly it all by yourself and nobody or nothing else is, is sitting behind you, it doesn't cost a lot to run that airplane. But if you want to put two or three or four or five or six more people in the plane with you, you can do that. We find uh, 
Typically our customers are extremely well researched coming in and they know the product well. I would compare a lot of our, our customers to the likes of you know, Tesla buyers, people who enjoy modern technology but also rely on safety and comfort and want to make sure that the experience for themselves and their family is top notch. My name is John Becker. I've been flying for 46 and a half years now. Ended up going on active duty. I was assigned to F-15. Went into commercial aviation. I'm lately flying the A330, predominantly to the Pacific or a crossover to Europe. John and I have been married for 40 years. The most recent exciting news is we purchased a Diamond 62. We've had it now two years? It's a little over two, two years. years. Tour with the Piper Company looking at Pipers in the hangar after the tour. And I turned around and, and I said, what's that over there? It was beautiful. Started looking around and went from the Cirrus and Cheryl one day said, why don't we just get the 62 instead of uh, um, the Cirrus and have two engines. And that's what we ended up ordering. I was flying F-15 from the U.S. to uh, Europe to deploy over there. And uh, one of my two engines broke a high pressure return line on the oil and all the oil left the engine, so it ended up shutting down in the middle of the North Atlantic, about 700 miles south of uh, Iceland. So I ended up flying a twin-engine airplane, single engine, for about 700 miles to get to Iceland. So that was a nice day to have a spare engine because if I was in an F-16 with one engine, I'd be in the water, North Atlantic, 34 degree water, and I'd have probably been not sitting here today. twin-engine redundancy, you can't put a price on, on that sort of safety. The airplane gives you tremendous opportunity to go wherever you want, whenever you want, and know that having that twin-engine, you're comfortable flying across oceans or over mountains or, or through uh, bad weather or at night. Uh, it's really a, an all-capable airplane. Of course, the rule of thumb in a single-engine aircraft flying over water is always be within gliding distance of land versus the ability to just go straight across it with two engines, knowing that you've got that redundant backup there to help you get across in the event you ever had a problem with one. The Rocky Mountains are a perfect example. This airplane has the capability of flying on a single engine at 13,000 feet. So not only can they cross the rocks safely on one engine, uh, they're going to get to the airport they need to go to. Direct to is everybody's favorite uh, function on the aircraft. You don't have to give a whole lot of consideration to what is below you. It's that design that makes it so simple to fly and so safe to fly and gives it so many benign characteristics that uh, don't allow pilots to find themselves in a situation where they require a superior skill set in order to get themselves out. So, um, and we have examples of that time and time again with a lot of lower time pilots coming out of single engine airplanes that transition into the DA-62 and do it very well. We have a, a pilot in the United States who's just achieved his private pilot's license starting from zero flight time and did everything on a DA-62 and I, I, I think that really is a testament to how easy this airplane is to fly and how uh, easy it is to control. Hi, my name is Mike Bannigan. I live here in Frisco, Texas. I'm an entrepreneur by trade and I own a DA-62. I learned how to fly on the 62. You know, everyone steered me away from learning how to fly on a twin and I'll tell you, I'm not young. I'm, I was 52 when I started to learn. And I realized, you know what? I wanted a bigger plane. I wanted one that was more stable. I wanted to be able to learn how to fly on the airplane I owned. And so I decided I'd purchase a 62 and learn how to fly on that. It was easy to learn how to fly on a 62. And I really enjoy it because I can take my family with me. I don't have to worry I'm limited on space or I'm limited on weight. I have five children. I have a home in Key Largo, Florida as well. And so I needed a plane with reach and it needed to be comfortable and stable and the DA-62 was perfect for the mission. To put this a little bit in context, you have to go back and look at where we came from. Conventional legacy twin engine airplanes, lots of levers and fuel pumping here and there and this and that, and they're complicated. The loss of an engine, a conventionally configured multi-engine airplane, can be a very catastrophic event. And a lot of that comes from the need for the pilot to make instantaneous decisions that are the right instantaneous decision, instinct almost. It just happens and you don't think about it. So the whole idea is make it all automatic. 
So the traditional twins, when you lost an engine, it was a, a big emergency. And that's certainly not the case with our twin. The design of our twin, when you lose an engine, it's really a non-event. There are no mixtures to control. There are no propeller settings to adjust. So the, uh, the, the, the piloting aspect of things becomes a lot easier. The 62 has a lot of very benign flight characteristics. So in the event you had to secure an engine in an emergency situation, um, it's uh, quite simply as easy as uh, turning off an engine master switch. At that point, uh, the uh, electronic control units, the ECUs uh, uh, on that particular engine, will feather the propeller uh, on the pilot's behalf and it automatically reduces the drag on that side of the aircraft. Couple that with the fact that the uh, DA-62's engines are relatively close to the fuselage. You reduce the amount of adverse yaw that you might otherwise have in the event of a, a catastrophic failure of an engine. So the airplane remains very controllable even with one engine. I demonstrate it often when we're, uh, when we're doing a demonstration flight where I'll, I'll completely shut down an engine, retrim the aircraft and take my hands and feet completely off the controls and show a pilot a 450 foot per minute climb at 6,000 feet with four people on board. So what we're going to do here now is uh, we're, we're going to shut down the right engine on this airplane. I am going to engine master off, okay? Uh, if you look at the right engine there, the ECU has automatically feathered the propeller for us, so the drag that we would have otherwise had to correct is already gone for us. Um, I'm holding a little bit of uh, pressure with my left foot right now, which is compensating for our, our left engine, our good engine, trying to make us turn right. Okay, so I'm going to put a little bit of power on here. We'll maintain our altitude. I'm still, I'm still holding in uh, foot pressure on the left side, but I'm going to buy back that foot pressure with a little bit of rudder trim. Okay. So we've got rudder trim in there. That pressure on my foot is gone. I've given us a little bit of a nose up attitude with our elevator trim. And at this point, I am hands and feet off. So my hands and feet are off the controls, we've got the right engine shut down. I don't know of another twin in the world that does it this nice. We're at 4,400 feet, we've got three adults on board, we've got 50 gallons of fuel, we've got camera equipment. I'm going to put a little bit more power on here, and we're going to start a climb. Put your uniform fuel, contact front 13425 now. Now the benefit of the Austral engine is that it's uh, turbocharged, so we uh, have the uh, we do enjoy sea level horsepower with these engines until about 12,000 feet. Um, so they are able to uh, carry us uh, all the way up to 13,000 feet on on one engine. There you go. We're maintaining a 300 foot per minute climb on one engine. And the airplane still has the ability to maneuver on one engine quite nicely. Uh, in most cases, when you're twin engine training, you'll only ever make turns toward the operating engine. Uh, with this airplane, we've got so much uh, uh, controllability with this aircraft between our rudder and ailerons that I could turn toward the dead engine, which is generally something you don't want to do in a, in a twin environment with that engine shut down for fear of the good engine rolling the aircraft over onto its back. But because this airplane is so stable and it's so benign in all of its flight characteristics, it's uh, really nice to fly in just about any configuration, um, including engine out. So you can imagine uh, we're 200 miles over water right now and we're on our way to the Bahamas and we, you know, we hit a Pelican or something like that and we had to shut an engine down for precautionary measures. Uh, the airplane is still going to get us there. We're still going to land safely at the Bahamas. The airplane is just, I, I mean, there's, there isn't any, a, another airplane out there that, uh, that I'm this confident in. I love flying it. You can continue to maintain a climb all the way up until you get to your service ceiling, 13,400 with a single engine, that's, that's where it'll climb to. If you're above that, it'll maintain altitude, and uh, 13,400 is high enough that uh, there's not a whole lot of places in, uh, in the world that you're going to get where you're going to be flying one of these where that's not enough to uh, get you high enough to safely make it to your destination. And as we were doing today when we were simulating an engine out and feathered engine, we were a Diamond 40. We were flying the airplane about 130 knots, I think, 125, 130 knots, and I believe we were at 70% power at 6,000 feet, just cruising along, pretending we were a Diamond 40. You know, so we turned our 62 into a Diamond 40, and you wouldn't have any problem going an extra 50 miles to find an airport in a Diamond 40. So with one engine shut down in the 62, 
I tell people we just turned into a Diamond 40. Flies great, single engine. It's one of the most common myths out there that 100 low lead is actually low lead. It's not. Avgas, 100 low lead, a good marketing spin, but it actually has four times the lead content of previous lead car gasoline. So it's a very bad fuel for the environment. And right now it's estimated that 50% of all airborne lead contaminants are coming from aviation fuel, Avgas specifically. But that's where our, our aircraft have the advantage burning the jet fuel. And they also burn 40% less fuel than the traditional gas airplane of the same horsepower. So you're not only burning lead-free, cheaper fuel, but you're also burning about half as much as in a gas engine. The fact that we're burning uh, lead-free fuel, I think is a really big step forward as to where aviation is probably going to have to head. Leaded fuel will become banned at some point in the future, there's just no doubt. And the fact that uh, the Austro engines are so fuel efficient, there's nothing to compare it against at this point in a piston aircraft, especially a twin. It's kind of funny, pull into an FPL and walk inside, tell the people at the front desk, they say, you know, I need a top up Jet A, and yes, sir, you know, they're expecting you're going to top up your Gulf Stream. Well, you know, and you know, the, the fuel bill is $123. People always think multi-engine just means double the fuel. Where this thing burns 16 gallons an hour total, where you look at your competition single engine burns 16 gallons an hour plus with one engine. And the maximum fuel burn at full throttle in the DA62 is only 18 gallons an hour total. Uh, so that's not per engine. Most people say, no, per engine. No, that's, that's total for both engines, nine gallons a side. So it's extremely fuel efficient for a twin, and even as a twin, competes with fuel burn of a high-performance single. In most comparable twins, we're seeing you know, fuel burns between 16 and 25 gallons an hour per side versus what I typically cruise at um, is 7.6 gallons per hour a side, and that's at an 80% power setting. So 80% is pretty much where I run an aircraft, uh, you know, from a day-to-day -day operation. There's uh, there's 80 percent load right now, and what's different about the, uh, the the way you read your power settings in the uh, in the, the the Diamond airplane is that you're dealing with a percentage of load now versus a manifold pressure and uh, a fuel flow setting. For ease of use, the pilot only has to look over here and figure out what percentage of load they want to operate at, set it, and forget it. 80% is pretty much where I would set up to fly on a day-to-day -day basis. It's going to get you a 15.2 gallon an hour fuel burn between uh, the two Oscos. Uh, at uh, 10,000 feet, it'll also net you about a 180 uh, not true airspeed. Uh, best economy in this airplane, uh, you'd set it up at about a 70% load. So there's 70% right now. That is 13.4 gallons an hour of total fuel burn and I expect that we'll see about a 155 knot uh, true airspeed at 5,000 feet for that. So if you consider the amount of fuel that I will burn during a 300 mile leg versus what a competitor's aircraft might burn in the same distance, it's uh, night and day. As far as operating costs, the advantages of the Diamond, we can typically run two engines and 180 knots on roughly the same fuel burn that the Cirrus would, would use to fly slightly slower and you have the added safety factor of the second engine. I'm cruising at about 75% and I'm burning a little over 14 gallons an hour for both engines. You can pretty well get a five to nine hour range out of this, uh, this aircraft depending on where you, where you want to set the, uh, the throttle. So you want to just go play around the local area, you can fly around at five gallons a side at 50%, 55% power. You know, burn, I think we burned today on our little flight um, nine gallons total of fuel and we were in the air for an hour just having a good time with the airplane and we're paying 270 a gallon for jet a right now so it's what about 25 dollars worth of fuel burn for an hour flying time and all the fun we had i was absolutely fascinated by diamond aircraft and the fact that it was right here in the city that i was doing my university education in and uh, also doing my flight training in the aircraft so to see this building uh, where they used to manufacture uh, mosquito bombers during World War II, it just has such a history and legacy in aviation. And then to see what it became with Diamond Aircraft and building modern technology aircraft and having uh, such a vertically integrated company, I was just fascinated by it the first time I saw it and took a keen interest in being part of it. 
At the time, they were not hiring, but I felt so passionate about Diamond and wanting to join the company. I said, well, is there anything I can do to start? And he gave me an opportunity in the materials department to start. I remember the first day that Scott walked into the factory, a lot younger man than he is now, um, with a far less responsible job. He started at the bottom, literally at the bottom, and now runs the company. People are talking to him about Diamond Aircraft from outside this company that they uh, are able, he's able to speak the same language, right? And you, how can you speak intelligently about a product unless you've spent the time to, to fly it? He's not uh, somebody who is just thrust into a leadership position from a, a different background or a different discipline. He's been a real boots on the ground, hands in the dirt kind of uh, leader. It certainly goes a long ways when he can actually talk the talk and walk the walk. The CEO of Diamond Aircraft flies his own family in a DA-62. It really is a testament to the product. The people and the product are the two things that inspire me the most. Um, as I said, I had the opportunity to grow up in this company alongside many of our colleagues. Walking that production floor uh, anytime, day or night, uh, always excites me. And sometimes late at night when I'm the last one here, I'll go down and go sit in an airplane and just kind of make sure everything's up to par and that uh, and look for opportunities on how we can improve our products so i regularly uh, walk the production line obviously i was uh, in charge of operations so i'm very familiar with it but i like to ensure that uh, the product uh, quality remains there as we uh, grow our workforce i'm a career instructor and career corporate pilot i fly small business jets um, i fly the, the honda jet i fly the gulf stream but most of what I do, 80% of my flying, is teaching in the DA-62. So I started the school about four and a half years ago, made the business model around modern aircraft. When we began and, uh, entertaining the idea of having a multi-engine trainer and building a training course outline and a syllabus, we really searched the market for what's the, the best multi-engine airplane. And best is kind of subjective, so we're obviously talking the first thing was safety, the second component was reliability. The DA-62 had all the components that we were looking for. We're really happy with the results. When we're training people to go to the airlines, this is the kind of technology you're seeing in, in modern jets. The DA-62, we're usually seeing people finish in anywhere from a nine to 10 day time frame transitioning from single engine to multi-engine. When I first purchased the airplane, flew it from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, all the way to Sonoma County, California, and it performs great at altitude, crossing the Rockies at 20,000 feet with oxygen. It was the step right below owning your own business jet. I really enjoy mountain flying, and the DA-62 is an excellent mountain airplane. It flies in high density altitude situations at 20,000 feet, still getting close to the 200 knots true airspeed in that airplane. The takeoff and landing distances are extremely impressive. It goes in and out of short strips, which is a big plus, especially in high density altitude situations. The airplane's turbocharged. Having a airplane that's capable of mountain flying is a big plus. You can get to point A to point B quicker, and you can get in and out of small airports that you would otherwise not be able to get into in jets or airlines. Uh, it also has the ability to land on unapproved strips such as gravel or grass, so you can really take the airplane a lot of places. When you fly the DA-62, you feel like you're wearing it. It's extremely responsive. It has a control stick, which is similar to what we have in our extra 300. So when we fly that airplane, it's the same kind of feel. Somebody that's coming from a, a different brand with, with cables and pulleys, where this is push rods, little control makes a, makes a big difference. We're doing very aggressive power on stalls and power off stalls. The DA-62 is remarkable because it just stays in a buffet. There is no wing drop whatsoever. The airplane just doesn't want to stall. This airplane is just a is a is a sweetheart when it comes to uh, stall performance. If you set it up with the uh, gear down and the flaps down, you can pull it into a deep stall, and it'll just just buff it like crazy, belly to earth. And then as soon as you let go of the back pressure, it'll start flying again. It's a really forgiving airplane. There we go. So there's 75 knots. When you get to the water, make the and I'm just going to apply a little bit of power there, and I'm going to hold 75 knots. We're holding the altitude that we're at here right now, about 5,100 feet. 
and it's always nice to be able to uh, show people that the airplane will fly steadily at this power setting and at this airspeed because you can imagine yourself right now in the downwind with a you know a 152 or maybe a little archer or something like that you don't have to worry about chewing off his tail feathers at this point Nice and smooth, yeah, still lots of aileron authority, and that is part and parcel to that long wing that we have uh, with the ailerons all the way outboard, uh, coupled with the vortex generators out there that are helping to keep that airflow stuck to the ailerons. So you still have lots of controllability, even at the slower flight uh, envelope. And then uh, what I'll do here now is I'll bring it right back to the stall, okay? So at this altitude with the load that we have on here right now, we should hear the stall warning at about 72, 71 knots. There it is, 71 knots. And in a flight exam, you would certainly be expected to recover right here at this point. You can start to feel the onset of a buffet. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to demonstrate what a deep stall looks like. I'm going to continue to bring this stall all the way back. Oh, that's the horizontal stabilizer that you feel rattling back there. That's the airflow buffeting off the horizontal stabilizer. Oh, this airplane's stick is almost completely back as far as it'll go here right now. Descending 850 feet a minute, but this airplane is fully, fully stalled. Uh, you'll notice there's no violent tendencies to drop a wing or to drop a nose, and the recovery is quite literally just release the uh, back pressure on the stick. I'm going to start bringing up the flaps. The power is coming back on. Our airspeed is increasing. Ending gear is coming up. Our landing gear is up and secure, and our last notch of flap is up, and we're going to start to accelerate again. It was all the way back as far as it would go, and the airplane still didn't want to do anything nasty. The engine on the DA-62 is the Ostro AE330. It is a uh, four-cylinder, two-liter uh, turbocharged engine producing 180 horsepower, running on jet fuel, of course. The engines are extremely reliable. The Austro Turbo engines, um, I've had the pleasure of flying it for a year and a half. Never had one hiccup, not one issue at engine start. It didn't matter if it was extremely hot or a quick turn or if it was cold. It was always there and always worked. I think realistically, using automotive technology or having the backbone of what led to Austro's technology being proven in the automotive industry has helped it to be uh, so reliable. So because it's all controlled by the computer, uh, you pretty much you just push the button and it starts. Just like a like a car, just like it should. So even the the run up now is you have a run up and you push the button, it cycles the prop and it says, "Yep, you're good to go." And once that's once that's done, you're good to fly. Like a Lycoming or Continental is air cooled. This is water cooled. So there's our radiator under there, and it it has coolant just like your car. So it maintains a constant engine temperature. So you have to worry about shock cooling the engine or or over temping the engine. There's no spark plugs, so you have no magnetos. Uh, this one is controlled through a FADEC electronic control unit. There's two of them per engine, so you have redundancy. It's similar to the computer on your car that controls all those things, but really on steroids uh, in terms of redundancy and software and ability to handle altitude changes. And this one is also turbocharged. Doesn't matter whether it's cold or whether it's hot. It uh, it starts the same. When you pull up to the pumps in your vehicle and you shut your car off and fill up, you don't expect to have to uh, get back into that car and have trouble starting it. It's the same thing with the DA-62, the Austro engine, you just jump right in, engine master on, you hit the starter button and away it goes. If you compare a DA-62 to some of the competitor airplanes that are out there that do a similar job, they cost over twice as much money. They burn twice as much fuel to do exactly the same job. You know, when I think about what this plane does versus the DA-62, uh, it's, it's really almost the same payload, the same number of passengers, two-thirds the altitude, two-thirds the true airspeed, uh, incredible redundancy of system, but the DA-62 is one-third of the price of this, and frankly, it's less than one-third of the operating cost. Before I bought a Diamond, I looked at other airplanes. I actually flew in a Cirrus before I decided on uh, flying a Diamond. And I went up in the Cirrus, I did a lot of research. You know, a lot of the selling features is it has a parachute. Well, that's not the way I want to land an aircraft, right? I think that's just the way you crash. For me, the reason I chose a diamond and a twin is I wanted that second engine. 
I wanted the ability to go up, feel comfortable, know with my family in it, I felt safe. I did fly other airplanes that had the side stick or it had the yoke. And what I really enjoyed was the center stick on a diamond. It really makes you feel like a fighter pilot out there. I've looked at other airplanes, specifically the first airplane we looked at was a Malibu. I got in the cockpit and I said, I, I would never fly this airplane anywhere for fun. So <laughs> almost immediately that knocked the Malibus out of uh, what we were considering. We actually looked at a Cirrus and then uh, we, we decided we wanted to go with a twin engine airplane versus a parachute. Personally, if I'm flying night IFR, I like having the second engine to be able to plan my arrival with the ground. Well, I would rather have another engine than a parachute any day. You can pick where you're gonna land. Um, if you deploy a parachute, you don't know where the wind's gonna take you. Um, and then oftentimes over the mountains or in rough terrain, then I'm coming down as softly as the videos show. Multi-engine aircraft is reliable. You've got two engines, you get redundant systems plus the stall characteristics of the aircraft. It still flies in a stall. It actually comes down in a stall softer than a single engine with a parachute. 62, I think it's eight inches wider than a Cirrus and more headroom when you're sitting up there. So uh, size-wise, it's great. You can actually put three people in the, in the middle row of three. Again, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. I'll take my daughter to college in it and she'll say, Dad, how long is the flight? And I tell her, who cares? We're gonna get up in the air and we're gonna go and we're gonna enjoy the ride. I have a big family. I've got five children. So anytime we fly, there's seven of us. This airplane offered plenty of room and space that I can take my kids to college. I can take the young ones with me and go for lunch anywhere we wanna head out to. And it really factored into why I decided on a 62. I love going places for the first time. Say for instance, we just went to the UP about a month ago and we landed up there for the very first time. I'm from Michigan, I've never been up there. I've never seen Lake Superior. And when I see these things for the first time, that's when I get really, really happy. From here, it's an 11 hour drive because of the Mackinac Bridge. After we had three really nice days there and then flew home, how long was the flight? Hour 45. Yeah. For what is normally, if the bridge is open, it, an 11 hour drive basically. So I'm just really grateful that we have the ability to do that. You know, I've actually had my whole family in there. Uh, we had six of us and uh, we went off to a, a, d a dinner with my, for my mother. And uh, you know, it was, it was great. Uh, it was an hour and a half flight, six of us fit in comfortably and, and, uh, and went. We sold one to a gentleman, he's got a nanny. He had two kids, his wife and him. And uh, they all fit in with, with ample bags and they go for a weekend trip. People equate it to the SUV of the sky because it, it's very versatile. You know, it, it's luxurious, like a, I guess like a Cadillac. I mean, you can haul just about everything you need to, plus some. Yeah, in a year of COVID especially, um, it's great to have your own airplane, right? I can pick up and see my son in the Air Force and Destin. He's not allowed to leave, I think, with outside 10 miles of his Air Force base. So it's great for me to be able to pick up, fly to Destin, see my son, and come back home. I have another son up in Denver, and the same thing. I really enjoy the freedom that Diamond offers me. So the founder of Diamond, Christian Dries, he was watching a Formula One race, and the thing just spun out of control, crashed, smashed, and just pieces everywhere, everything else, and stuck. what was left stuck up against the wall. and. The guy had to have been dead, right? So we wait three or four or five seconds. Next thing you know, the guy gets out, waves, hey, I'm okay. And, and he looked at that and he looked at airplanes because he was a pilot and he thought to himself, why can you walk away from an accident in a car, but you're not gonna walk away from an accident in an airplane? He wanted to bring modern technology into an industry that was still stuck in the 60s and 70s. Bring the safety concepts that exist in the automotive industry and adapt that to airplanes and still give you good performance. And there, there are a lot of the legacy design airplanes that the more performance you get from the plane, the more complex it becomes, the more proficiency that the pilot requires uh, to maintain, to operate it safely. The, the more capable the airplane, the fewer people can do it. So let's expand out the performance envelope of the airplane, the capability of the airplane, uh, you know, and match that with pilots who perhaps don't have to be quite as proficient.
In the early days, it was a little bit like pushing a stone uphill. We were bucking uh, a very traditional, uh, conservative attitude, and then now there's this entirely new thing. We're gonna blaze this trail. Our number one priority is and always will be safety. At the core of our DNA here as a company and our founder, Christian Dries, uh, made it very clear, not just design the most efficient and modern aircraft of this century, but also to make them the safest aircraft in the world. The company decided that the primary, critically important things um, was occupant protection, occupant safety. It's unfortunate that a, a lot of the airplanes that are designed today, as safe as they are and as capable as they are, not allow a, a, an occupant to survive a, a severe crash. With the DA-62, the entire um, occupant cabin is a 26G uh, safety cage, uh, and we, we compare it often to uh, like a Formula One race car. So a driver in a Formula One race car hits the wall at 200 miles an hour and they still walk away. And that's the idea behind the, uh, the, the 26G safety cell around the occupant cabin in the DA-62. In the event of a high impact crash, you're going to have uh, the crash elements absorbing a lot of the inertia from uh, the, the, the occupants in their seats, which is going to help prevent any spinal injury seats are fixed in place with crash elements underneath. Instead of having the seat at a 90 degree angle, it's tilted back a little bit so that you slide into the seat and get cinched in with your seat belt in the case of a crash. DA-62's wing design is a dual spar. The reason it was done that way was in order to protect the fuel cell which runs up the center of the wing. The wing could certify with just one wing spar. We had chosen to go with two and the simple reason is because we want to protect the fuel. So in the event there was ever an off-field uh, landing or crash uh, with, a, with a DA-62, 42 or 40 for that matter, you would literally have to crash through the leading edge of the wing destroy a wing spar, and then rupture an aluminum fuel cell before you had any fuel spilled. On top of all of that, the fuel is jet fuel, so it is a lot less volatile than 100 low lead gasoline. So even if you did get to the point where you had um, a fuel spill of some sort, the chances of ignition are a lot lower than what you would find in a, in a gasoline powered aircraft. We have yet to record a uh, single post impact uh, fire in a diamond aircraft. The whole concept here came directly out of automotive. Uh, take the fuel tank and remove it from a crush zone. The fuel's got to be out in the wing, so let's protect it as much as physically possible. Let's put it in welded aluminum tanks and let's put that inside a structure, protect it behind a big carbon fiber wing spar. Put the fuel tank between that and another carbon fiber wing spar, which by the way doesn't have to be there. that fuel tank has to be connected to the power plant in some fashion. So if an impact is bad enough to deform structure, then let's connect all of these fuel system components together, you know, with flexible hoses so that if structure moves, you know, it's unlikely that it's gonna compromise the fuel system. Nobody had ever done this in GA before. Diamond went to extraordinary lengths to make this system as safe as it could practically be. It's not just a sales gimmick. It's very, very real. I've had people who have had incidents with their airplanes and they're, they're delighted to come back and get another one because that one saved their life. Unfortunately, fatalities will still happen in, in any part of the uh, aviation sector. Um, it's an unfortunate part of what we deal with. It's still much lower than what you would find on the highways, for example. We haven't had any accidents where there's been fatalities where it has been mechanical failure of the aircraft. We don't just have a great safety record because we got lucky. Uh, we have a good safety record because that's first and foremost in our safety culture. And we design products with safety in mind. And that result is what we see today after 25 years still being the safest airplane in the world. But it wasn't by accident. It was always designed in from the beginning. 
landing gear on the DA-62 is uh, very robust. It's probably more robust than it needs to be for an aircraft this size by rights. It is a, a trailing link landing gear with a very large tire and a very large oleo strut, which is a nitrogen oil-filled strut, and it will absolutely absorb everything you can drop on it. It really does make a bad landing feel good. The landing gear is so large and kind of in charge. You almost just fly it above the runway and it does the rest of the work for you. Super stable, plus the wide landing gear that it has on the mains. It's just really friendly and you know if you're kind of off a little bit on centerline it will almost auto correct for you um, straightening it out. It's really a dream to fly. From a safety standpoint uh, it's fail safe is down and locked so even if you lose hydraulic pressure in your hydraulic system the gear is down and locked. Uh, there's, a, there's an emergency lever and it will fall by gravity and lock. It has seven seats, I've filled all seven seats. For not just a marketing thing, I have put seven people in it with about 30 to 40% fuel, which has not been a problem because it's so fuel efficient. I'm 6'3". I have sat in, in every seat, even the, the far back, and I've got fairly long legs. I've had my kids in the far back as well. It's their favorite place to sit. They can plug in their headphones back there and give them their iPads, and they're just perfectly happy for as long as they need to fly. The DA-62 is speaking more to uh, charter operators in that one to three seat segment that are looking for a solution that's cost effective, comfortable, luxurious, and that matches what their passengers are used to from larger aircraft. And there's approximately 10 certified colors currently on the DA-62, and there are some more exciting colors in the works, more vibrant colors that will be coming out. Porsche Macan or, uh, or Cayman or something of the SUV because it, it is more like a sports car in the way that it, it the feel of it, the way you sit in it, um, the way it uh, wraps around you. It is like a luxury SUV type feel with the leather seats. They're comfortable, there's plenty of leg room, and they feel like they're in an upscale environment when they fly in the airplane. A level of comfort in the aircraft and the noise levels, the smooth, uh, easy ride, the large panoramic windows, so for the people who do like to look outside, the aircraft offers a very nice view. Surfaces have very comfortable materials attributed to them, Alcantara leather, which will just ensure that you're always on a soft surface. If you look at some of the stitching in the backrest as well, you'll notice that it's done in order to have more support for your lower back. Perforated leather that is being used in the center of the seat and carbon fiber all throughout the cabin as well. With the air conditioning, it stays very comfortable inside up to you know, some of the hottest days. It has an additional alternator that drives an all-electric air conditioner. We did certify the airplane for takeoff and landing with the air conditioner on. As opposed to like older airplanes, it's, oh, you gotta turn that off for takeoff and landing and this, that, and taxi, and you're like, oh, that's exactly when I want it, you know? <laughs> it's got more flexibility and elasticity in the, in, in the resin itself, so the DA-62 rides turbulence uh, significantly better with a flexible wing, kind of like when you're flying along in an airliner, you see the wing going up and down in turbulence. It's uh, nothing to be concerned about. It's actually absorbing the bumps, so you, you don't have to. We've designed the engine mounts to be more flexible than a conventional airplane engine, which is very rigid. The engine will actually move on those mounts a lot more, so the engine doesn't vibrate back through the airframe. You can quite literally take your headset off inside of a DA-62 and comfortably have a conversation without having to really raise your voice. I would compare it to the ambient noise level in a commercial airliner extremely quiet aircraft. You oftentimes, after a couple hour flight, you're fatigued from noises, you're fatigued from vibrations. Uh, you essentially don't have that in this airplane. It's a great platform for not just perfect days, but you know, you're gonna have weather days, and this aircraft is an all-weather aircraft. It's definitely a convenience to have USB connectors at every seat. You can stream XM music, but you also have USB charging in the back and LED overhead lighting. The ergonomics inside, they, they were thought out. You've got little things like a cubby up here for pens and paper and different things. An iPad you know, holder down here or the mounts over here. There, there's so many different little thought out touches that they put into this. The creature comforts uh, for the pilot make it uh, one of the nicest, most comfortable airplanes to fly. There are lots of times when I'm taking these airplanes to shows that are clear across the continent. And uh, the ability to just extend the, the, the rudder pedals all the way to the to the forward stops and then uh, slightly rec recline the seat. 
and get yourself in a real comfortable position. Oftentimes you have people saying, oh, I'm, I'm six foot four, there's no way. I'm like, well, come out and try it. Now, everybody's body builds a little different, but for the most part, six foot four, six foot five, people still fit in them just fine and comfortably, which is key because on a three, four hour flight, you, know, you, you don't want to just start squirming around too much. You have capacity in the nose of the aircraft on both sides, actually. So it's real convenient for loading from outside the airplane. You can pop the nose luggage compartment open and throw the bags in the front. You actually can fit a full golf bag on the left side of the nose. You fold the back seats down, it fits a surprising amount of luggage. I'd say the most we've had in there is six giant bags or we've had several bikes in the back. It's a, it's a versatile space. One of the great options with the 62 is you can remove the third seat and put in the cargo tray, which I've done. Um, this summer when I went up to Montana, well, you load your fishing gear, you load your hiking gear, your guns, and everything in the back, and I was able to head up to Montana and really enjoy the outdoors. No issue with um, the load, the weight. The Garmin weather radar that we have on in the nose of this aircraft is uh, a very useful tool, especially for a pilot who is going to be doing a lot of flying in uh, heavy uh, instrument conditions. We're also getting weather from XM satellite weather, uh, NEXRAD, but in some cases they may be 10 to 15 minutes delayed. So if you are finding yourself flying along in uh, solid IMC conditions and um, there may be uh, embedded thunderclouds, you're going to see a, a reflection off of the, uh, the, the storm cell itself in real time and it's a real asset to a pilot who's otherwise saturated with, with flying in, in difficult conditions. Ability to have uh, a flight into known icing is very important, especially for uh, um, IFR flying. Uh, this part of the country, if you see cloud in the sky, you can be guaranteed that you're going to accumulate ice inside of it. I have had the DA-62 in just about every flight condition I can think of. Icing, for sure, uh, in the wintertime. And then when you look at the wing and see how clean they are and you see that clear glycol fluid uh, flowing across the wing surface, it really gives you peace of mind. When we had it, uh, the F-33 Bonanza, um, it didn't have any known icing capability. In fact, there was a prohibition in the flight manual that said you couldn't even fly it if there was forecast icing. So if you have a day here in Michigan from about November through April, you have, always have clouds and there's always a forecast of icing. So technically you couldn't fly the airplane if you had to go up through the clouds because it was forecast icing. So basically the airplane would sit over there in the, one of the tea hangers from November through April. The advantage of the, the DA-62 is the materials that it's made of. With it being an all-carbon fiber fuselage, the material that we're using here to build aircrafts is uh, proprietary to Diamond. And it has significant advantage because it is used the moment it is created. We've always built all composite structure airplanes since the, the beginning of Diamond. And more and more people, um, especially the big aviation companies such as Boeing and Airbus, are implementing more composite into their designs and that, that optimal strength to weight ratio just makes it the perfect choice and it does not fatigue like metals. You know, metals will fatigue uh, with time, but com composites do not. We have aircraft still operating that were delivered in the early 90s, DA-20s, uh, that are over 25 years old now and uh, approaching 20,000 flight hours uh, and working hard in, in flight training environments where uh, people are learning to land and uh, you know bouncing down the runway quite often. So they take a beating and uh, they just keep performing and we, we don't see any degradation of the airframe when we do our major structural inspections and they're just holding up fantastically. Composite airplanes have some inherent advantages. Fiberglass, you know, epoxy composite airplanes do not corrode. You know, they will literally last forever. The airplanes are manufactured, designed and manufactured to such a level. The load tests that are done to failure on things like wing spars and those kind of things, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing. We have a flight school here on the airfield. They called us and said the airplane's landed gear up, it's on the runway, we dispatched a crew. We had the airplane back up and running, generating revenue within 11 days. Uh, gearboxes replaced, props replaced, uh, composite repairs performed, uh, repaints done, maintenance release, test flight, all in 11 days. We are certainly recognized for our strong uh, safety record and our safety culture. And that's why I put so much emphasis in present to underwriters to educate them on the brand and the product and to show them why we're different. We are really favored heavily upon 
by the insurance companies. We do uh, compile uh, gamma and NTSB uh, safety statistics, which show that we are really the industry leader in, uh, in safety first. So the diamond safety does give you the advantage uh, on insurance rates, and we work with a, c a company in the US that has preferential rates for diamond aircraft, so you'll see quite a big difference. There's several insurance companies that uh that understand the DA-62. They may require you to go up with an instructor for an additional five or 10 hours. Somebody with a fresh uh, multi-engine rating uh, shouldn't be scared of insurance on this plane. We also have uh, diamond financing. So we have uh, aircraft financing available for all of our products in the US. You can complete an application through our website and get approved within 24 hours. So it's quite an easy uh, process and we're here to help potential customers along and just help them make the, the right decision that's going to meet their mission. So yes, you can uh, also dry lease the aircraft back to a charter operator. Uh, so there are some, some operators that are already running this model quite successfully. A lot of people will consider a major purchase like a DA-62 as a, a business proposition. In a lot of cases, an owner may not even be a pilot and end up buying a DA-62 uh, to generate a revenue stream somewhere um, down the road. Leaseback opportunities with charter operators is a perfect example. Um, we're finding more and more people uh, calling in on the sales line asking about the opportunity to buy an aircraft and take advantage of the tax incentives and then utilize that airplane maybe for themselves in a small portion but then have somebody else operate the aircraft on their behalf. I really appreciate hand-built cars, right? All the Corvettes were handmade at the time. Um, I used to own Bentleys and I loved it because they were hand built. I knew that car was custom built for me. And same with Diamond. I know that airplane was built custom just for me and I could watch it being built. I really encourage everyone who's either thinking about buying a Diamond or buying a Diamond to go see how your airplane is made. It makes the difference. I mean, you can see the amount of quality that goes in to everything they do from building the fuselage to putting in the interiors. Uh, the work they do on the engines, it's a great experience. Unlike many aircraft, they build their own wires up there, they manufacture it, they put in the instruments, they really go the extra mile to make sure that they're building a high quality airplane. So the DA-62 for the North American market is actually made in North America. We're very open about how we go about things and how we produce the aircraft and we're very proud of what we do. Uh, so typically, having somebody walk through here and showing them and explaining detail by detail just in the materials that are used in the finish and the amount of detail that goes into every single aircraft. Everybody in this factory puts their heart and soul into the aircraft. You'll see it when we walk down the factory floor. Everybody knows each other by even name personally. And that goes to showing the quality and result of the product. All these little details that you don't see when the aircraft is fully assembled, it's really fascinating to see people's reactions as they're walking through here and realizing how much thought has been put into safety with this aircraft. Something so unique to this work environment that it's a family business that got big, but it still has that family feel. I mean, that's one of the most exciting things about diamond manufacturing is that vertical integration. So um, you know, most aircraft uh, facilities are just doing final assembly and they're getting all the bits and pieces from, from other suppliers. Um, in our case, we're doing everything from scratch. We, we even make our own impregnation machines for the resin and hardener. So we're mixing basically real-time prepreg um, with proprietary machines that Diamond invented and, and builds ourselves. Um, so it's, it's quite a unique process to literally see it go from rolls of cloth and barrels of resin and hardener into uh, eventually the, the fuselage shape and wing shape, but then ultimately, you know, flying it out the back door and getting it to a happy customer. There's, there's no greater feeling. I will often encourage uh, customers that are coming to look at the DA-62 to please go have a look at the competition first so that when they get in the Diamond DA-62, they're going to realize that it really does exceed the expectation that they got into the airplane with. It really is the best airplane in this category in the market. I have a lot of passion for talking to people about where this company is, uh, where it came from, where it's going, what we have on the horizon. Um, 
It's, it, it's easy for me to do because I love it so much. The sales process is really just the beginning of that relationship and that partnership. We do put a lot of effort into uh, creating a good ownership experience right from the first phone call and introduction, right through the, the production of their aircraft and the delivery, of course, which is always a happy day. And then our customer support team takes over and makes sure that they're well taken care of in the field through their ownership experience. Taking off and landing, I really enjoy it, right? Because you're there and you're in the moment and everything's happening quickly. And I'm like, I love this airplane. I love it, and I watch folks land in other airplanes, and you know, I see they're less stable, or they don't have as much control, and I'm like, I love my DA-62. It's incredibly important, especially when you have your children in the aircraft, right? You wanna know you're always in control, that the airplane is stable, that you know it's got all the safety features in it that you could possibly want, and you have the confidence in knowing you're going to get to exactly where you're going. I appreciate aviation. With Delta, I always feel we bring families together. With the commercial airline business, it's always, I think that's the nicest part about it. Um, we can do the same with ours. We can go see our family. Um, we have grandchildren, and uh, we've got the freedom to, especially under these circumstances, currently right now, where everybody's so restricted. It gives us a lot of freedom and peace of mind that we can fly and stay safe and be healthy. I'm just really grateful that we have this opportunity, and I know uh, I owe it all to you. <laughs> so, uh. you know, it's like one of my colleagues said one day. He said, "You know, when you're lying on your deathbed, the last thing that you're going to be saying is, I wish I had worked more. Why wait?'" You know, I think we spend so much time trying to justify this, and you know. We're trying to convince ourselves. Yeah, I mean, we sell airplane, brand new airplanes to people in their 80s. Stop trying to justify it, you know, and just enjoy it. You only live once.